So hi, uh, my name is Denise Cooper and I am uh, the president and founder of the Intersource Commons. And this talk is the beginning of a talk I'll probably give several times this year about some of the lessons that I learned from building Intersource Commons. So it's kind of a meta conversation about incenting people to join an effort like Intersource Commons. And I think it's applicable to pretty much any open source community. Um, I have done a lot of consulting to companies trying to build community behind their open source projects, and it's sort of the same steps. So here we go. So first of all, why the pirates? And why is that picture so blurry? Because it's a really tiny picture. It was it was taken with a, a, probably an Insta camera at uh, some point in the 70s. That is Steve Jobs on the left and John Scully on the right. And behind them is the famous pirate flag with the apple for one eye that Steve had made and um, hoisted over the building where the Macintosh was created. And they, they really espoused a pirate ethic. Um, in Silicon Valley, we talk a lot about skunk works and how you, you have to take any innovative idea out of the middle of the company and give it its own little breathing space because the antibodies inside the company will kill it otherwise. And that is sort of also true of Intersource, I think. It's definitely true of open source efforts. If it's the only thing that's open source in your huge company, it's got to be at the edge and it's got to be protected. Now, because Intersource is about changing the core of the company, at the end of the day, it's got to get to the middle, but it doesn't have to start there. It can start with a seed or an experiment, as I've written in several books now, that help you figure out where you're going. Well, we kind of did the, the commons the same way. Um, we actually started talking about Intersource at OSCON in 2015. I gave a keynote. And um, that was us admitting that we were starting to experiment with it. Uh, at the time, it was a gutsy thing to do because people like me had been saying no to internal open source for a really long time uh, because it didn't create more public code. But I came to a point in my consultancy after 20 years of working in open source, I was starting to see that we were losing momentum because we didn't have um, any more companies looking for engagement with open source that could get there on their own because they had cultural impediments. Um, I think that the situation's a little bit better today now that now that we've talked about intersource and people realize that community building is its own art. Learning to collaborate can be done inside your company in a way that's also additive to the to the whole. Anyway, these are the lessons that I learned, so at least some of them. First of all, I learned that good ideas don't need to die, uh, but they have to wait their time. The, um, Intersource was actually invented in the year 2000, but it couldn't work as an effort until open source won in the minds of the public because it was just too easy to discount it when people came along um, to, you know, there's always pushback against any change. And uh, the middle management, especially of, of companies were getting in the way. And sometimes the most senior engineers also kind of getting in the way of this forward progress away from excessive ownership culture. So it had to wait until open source won and companies got hungry to figure out how to build software in the same way. And um, so, you know, keep an eye on the good ideas that didn't quite make it over the finish line because you might find them useful again later. Second thing, you are what you measure. And what I'm saying there is really, you don't want to go overboard on measurement when you're trying to first understand what's going on in your culture and why it's difficult to get people to collaborate. When you do your first couple of experiments, you, you really can't go all in on metrics. Uh, and if you're in a company where metrics are a big deal, this can be a bit of a struggle. Um, when I say you are what you measure, you can use which metrics you're, you're using to push behavior. So for instance, if you're getting, and this happens to everybody at first, if, if people are holding onto their code too long because they're not comfortable giving it over to be read by somebody else. They, so they're over polishing and then they drop 30,000 lines on a poor trusted committer who has no time to do a good job of reviewing the code. Um, that's obviously a broken thing. You have to convince them to release early and often. 
And one of the ways to do that is announce far and wide that you're going to start measuring number of pull requests. And I promise you there'll be a lot more of them and they'll be smaller. Um, so metrics can be your friend, but you want to wait to apply really deep metrics until you have a good idea of which behaviors you're trying to change. Next thing, change agents are born, not made. This little girl is about to do a death-defying thing. <laughs> and and the, the people like her when they're children are gonna be reasonable change agents, I think. Um, there are a lot of people who want to engage in change agency that have no business doing it because it'll make them miserable as individuals. People like to shoot the messenger when you're trying to change things. And what I learned was it's possible to mitigate this effect if you educate people about what it is that they need to think about before they push their career in this direction. That's helped us find some really hardworking, um, serious change agents in the inner source commons. And they are some of the people that have stayed involved in the foundation and are helping to grow it because they wanna see the change that we've been talking about spread all across engineering. And they realize that they need allies but I realized that not everybody who comes through the door of inner source commons is one of those people. And that's okay, not everybody has to be that, but there have to be a few of them. And um, so I have some methods now for how to tell or how to help people do that assessment. And um, we'll maybe start submitting uh, that tutorial again to conferences now that inner source has gained some steam. We did it like half a dozen times um, a few years ago, and it was always really popular, but but we should probably start doing it again. Okay, preparation is key to scaling. And this is the Chinese Olympics, which had thousands of people doing amazing things. But the reason I picked this picture is because this woman looks like, if you just saw the stage level of her, she looks like she's doing everything on her own, but she has thousands of people under her. The truth is the kind of people that InnerSource appeals to are not the kind of people who know how to communicate effectively inside a company typically. So we do a little seed experiment and um, they prove to themselves and to their management that open source is gonna, or InnerSource is gonna work. And in some cases that it's gonna be a necessary stepping stone to get to open source, which is the whole reason I started talking about it. But then somebody in the upper management will say, this is a great idea. Thank you for showing us how it's done. Now tell everybody else in the company how to do it. And those people that originally got interested in this method go, oh. <laughs> or sometimes they might say, you asked. Like they're not ready for, for that kind of communication. They don't have the, the chops. That's not what they're good at. So what I advise companies do is get communicators involved and interested in inner source within the company as soon as it's showing promise, maybe even while the first seed is being set up so that they can start looking for the storyline that's gonna be compelling throughout the whole organization because that is the hardest thing to do and it is different per culture. Steve Jobs knew how to do that for his team building the Mac, but it didn't wouldn't have worked for everybody at Apple. He was doing a special thing. The problem is the people that want to do intersource tend to be the special people and then they have to infect the rest of the company with the success of this endeavor. Um, Russ Rutledge, who you saw earlier, is super good at figuring out what value was just created in whatever stage of the process he's at and then broadcasting that back to management. But that's not the same as getting every engineer on your side and he's had to figure out ways to do that within his culture too so this is a big lesson preparation is the key to scaling you've got to start early if you're expecting the whole company to do this and then my last big takeaway for this talk although i have some illustrative points still in future slides is just like open source inner source and inner source commons is made out of people these are people at the last summit that we did. If you look carefully, you'll see an awful lot of Asian faces. That's because the summit was pointed towards um, Asia Pacific and you know, done in a time zone that was comfortable for that part of the world. Um, it was the largest summit we've had so far, more than a thousand people attended. This is just a little piece of that. But I have learned a lot in my whole open source career that I've been applying to this issue of inner sources people. And these are things that any open source effort could, could benefit from as well. So I'll go through them quickly. 
Um, so the first one is as a leader, you've got to check your ego at the door. Um, I, I worked for 20 years pushing my ego out as a personification of the future of open source. There were a handful of us that traveled around the world talking to governments and companies and schools, individuals to push this idea of the future of open source. That's not the only piece of the puzzle that got open source over the line, but it was a big piece of the puzzle, I think. And, and that was about pushing ego. But to build a community that you hope will, will last after you're done, because I'll retire at some point coming up here, um, you have to do a different thing. You have to give everybody ownership in the thing that you're talking about. And this is, you know, all good maintainers know this. Uh, there's a few bad maintainers that are having to learn this now because of the emphasis on diversity and inclusion right now. But it's really important. And this is a lesson I'm still learning. I'm not claiming to be good at this, but I'm saying that if I wasn't interested in doing this, I don't think Intersource Commons would have gotten very far. Um, I have various lieutenants that, that we've you know, given more responsibility to because they've shown both aptitude and interest. And that's how you grow a, a, a community is you give away responsibility as much as you can and try to be you know, a reasonably benign um, leader and treat everybody the same, treat everybody equally and kindly. So that's the first thing. The second thing is open source and inner source are both enlightened self-interest endeavors. If it's not making the people that are your practitioners feel like they're getting somewhere, then they're not gonna stick around. So you have to help them grow their careers. Um, for Intersource Commons, we did a lot of focus early on on training people how to um, speak effectively, how to write a talk quickly. I wrote this talk very quickly and how to speak effectively about, about the thing. And now we pick them out of the crowd and say, we'd like to hear you talk about this at the next summit. Um, people who have never given a talk at the scale that we're talking about. And then we coach them um, to help them get through. I, we also... For a long time, we taught how to write a um, Ignite talk, which is a, a five minute format talk, sort of like a lightning talk, but the slides self advance. Um, so invest in people's careers. I spend a lot of time mentoring people that reach out to me on Intersource Commons to answer questions about this stuff. And I refer them as much as I can in the direction that they wanna go. If they need to meet somebody to get there, I try to make that happen. So remember, enlightened self-interest is key and help them. And then last, and we have rest to stink, thank for the phrasing of this, praise all contributions. We try very hard to be welcoming when people show up at Intersource Commons, and we try very hard to recognize every contribution. Um, Georg Grüter, who is the vice president of the, of the board and I as president, do a talk at every summit where we go over the major contributions that people have made in the last since the last summit. We've had some amazing contributions. All of our training materials have been already translated into multiple languages by, by volunteers. Um, we just had a guy spend his Christmas vacation redoing our website because he felt like it was time. You know, So praise is really effective at getting people to stay engaged and continue to move forward. Um, so I think the future is really bright for Intersource. I think that it is a form of piracy in a way because it's taking old ownership culture out of the picture. It's, it's calling it out for what it is, which is an old fashioned way to do things. It's like a monarchy. We need to go for a more um, generalized and, and everybody's in the boat together kind of uh, approach so that all the boats will rise. And um, that's what I have to say. And I will go over to the breakout room now if anybody wants to hear me talk some more. Um, happy to do that. And thank you again so much, Voss Backstage, for a first opportunity to work on this talk, which I'll be refining. So if you see it coming in another venue, it'll be a little different. I'll have different, different examples every time. And I hope you've enjoyed it. And don't forget to join the pirate band. Arr!